Okay, let's, uh, why are we talking about Raman spectroscopy today? So I start uh, giving you some arguments on uh, why when we talk about light matter interaction, Raman spectroscopy is very interesting, okay? So just uh, starting with this, uh, uh, reminding you that uh, if you shine a material with a one specific wavelength, you will have a lot of Rayleigh scattering, but you also have the inelastic scattering that can be the Stokes or the anti-Stokes, depending whether the light will lose or gain energy from the material. And usually and most uh, often people when the light lose or gain energy from the material, it's gaining energy as quantums of uh, vibration that we call phonons. And uh, the spectrum looks generally like that. So you have at zero, you have a huge intensity where zero here means actually the energy of the incoming light. So this is what you don't want when you like Raman spectroscopy. So you want to uh, somehow filter this out. And then you have upshifted or downshifted in energy. You have the Stokes and anti-Stokes components. And uh, very well, always the anti-Stokes component is, is lower than the Stokes because the probability to destroy a phonon is higher, is lower, sorry, than the probability of creating a phonon in the material. Here I give you, uh, we, we came from these, from the moon and from the earth to very small uh, objects, okay? So this is a single wall carbon nanotube lying on a surface. And the freak, the, this gray color that you see here is actually the frequency of this uh, carbon-carbon stretching that makes this material. And if you come with an AFM tip and you just give a little kink on the carbon nanotube and you look what happens to the frequency, you see that you can, by just giving a little, little movement on the tube, you are actually stretching this tube a little bit because you, you, uh, you push the, the tube here. And you see that the frequency changes up to a point. And this is actually a way that we used to understand how the nanotube interacts with the surface. And there was a lot of things interesting here. Notice that we pushed the nanotube here and the strain actually happens far away and not at the position where you happen. And this happened because of the dynamics. When you push the tube, it's of course, the strain is where you pushed, but when you release, this place recoils back and the far away position does not recoil. And the, the gradient in strain gives you a way to measure the interaction between the tube and the surface. Okay. So this is a very simple in the perspective of uh, you are looking at one specific frequency of one small object that you can move. But when you go to bio, of course, you have a, a more complex structure. Okay, So what these two fellows, you, you can talk to them for more... Uh, uh, more details about this in the posters. So they take a, a piece of brain, okay, and they locate a beta amyloid plaque that is related to the development of Alzheimer. And you do what we call a hyperspectral analysis. For, for each position, you take one Raman spectrum. So you have these, uh, let's say, one entire set of uh, uh, Raman spectrum for each position. And then you look... Now it's a, the carbon nanotube has a very simple spectrum, but when you look into a biologic material, then I had, I'm still trying to learn how to move with this thing. Then you have, let's see if here I can do it better. Then you have a very complex Raman picture because you have lots of atoms, lot of vibration modes. But still, if you do a very careful wor uh, work, you see that uh, when the uh, when the peptide is in the alpha helix or beta helix structure, there are changes that you can locate. 
So if you learn, if you do a very careful experiment and you see what are the changes, what is the fingerprint of this specific system, then you can make an image, a very detailed image of the plague and notice, for example, that uh, here is the amyloid aggregate and everything in between here is actually the inflammatory uh, process that happens. And we can look uh, Dif very different spectrum, different uh, um, uh, animals with uh, different ages or developments of Alzheimer. And then you notice that here is the control and here is the uh, young animal and the, here is the older animal. So by analyzing the spectrum, you can even say the stage of development of these, uh, uh, let's say, this biological marker as related to the age of the the of the animal, okay? So, but this, uh, I would say this is still very, very classical in some senses, okay? Let's go back to the principles and go into something deeper and very quantum. Uh, uh, I found it very interesting, Danielle explained how this talk is about how to look at the quantum, how to find the quantum where uh, where usually it would be noise or et cetera. So I, I was saying that you have the Stokes and the anti-Stokes. A physicist, if you like Feynman diagrams, you, you describe it as the laser coming and then it interacts with the material and the excited material generates a phonon. And then the light that is uh, scattered has a frequency downshifted in energy because it lost the energy to the phone. This is the Stokes process. And the anti-Stokes is the opposite. The anti-Stokes, the light comes and there is a phone on the material. And then this phone is destroyed and this light that appears is upshifted in energy. So these are the processes that always happen. And this process, again, is more likely than the anti-Stokes. So usually people only care about this one. They don't care about that. But it has been predicted in the 70s by Klitschko. It's a Russian uh, uh, physicist. That you can have a process like that. The phonon that is created here is actually destroyed in the anti-Stokes process. And in this situation, the pair of Stokes and anti-Stokes photons, they must be correlated by the fact that they were created by the same one phonon, okay? And here I will not uh, go too deep on this, but uh, this is a process where the outgoing photons are somehow related to a phenomenon, a quantum phenomenon that had happened inside the material. And the way we do to look at this and to find this is, uh, so first you have a sample here that is, uh, for example, water, okay? And that was cited by Daniel. And then you have a laser that you like this laser to be uh, very powerful and quantized, uh, uh, post for you to do nice uh, time correlations. And instead of throwing this laser, and this looks like not a, instead of using a spectrometer, you change the spectrometer by two photodetectors, the avalanche photodiodes usually, and you do the correlation measurement on time. So uh, every time one photon comes into the Stokes branch, you see how long it takes for the photon to arrive in the anti-Stokes. And if you if you are talking about uh, phonons mediating the process, the distance between these two processes can only leave can only happen within the phonon lifetime, and this is how doing uh, just doing the the uh, time correlation, you can filter out from all the mass, all the noise, all the light. You can filter out the pro the two photons that are actually correlated. Okay. And what we did with this thing is first we we saw this in water. Okay, so this is a picture that shows that uh, this is the Raman regular Raman intensity is, and here is the uh, amount of correlated phot photons. And we show that if you measure very many different materials, it's not only water, but any uh, 
transparent material that light can, light can go through will show this effect and you can do a lot of uh, information there, okay? And now we are uh, studying polarization and I can uh, tell you very, being very optimistic here that uh, I believe soon we will demonstrate that they are not only quantum correlated, but they are also entangled. And this entangled in polarization, this is what we are hoping to show, okay? but. We are not there yet for me to share this with you, okay? So now I go to a different topic that is also, again, about how to look at uh, the quantum phenomena into these things, okay? And I, I made the spectrometer a little bit complicated. So this is the laser going into the sample and then going back to the detectors. But I want to do light scattering in uh, with nanometer resolution, okay? Because I want to see one single molecule. And to do that, what I do is I couple on, on top here, an AFM system, an atomic force microscopy system, holding a nano antenna. So this antenna will uh, take the light that is usually illuminates, uh, if you're used, if you focus the light very nicely, you get a focus that is like a hundred, uh, uh, a micrometers inside. So you cannot focus light by less than a micron. And then you, you will come with this antenna that's nanometric, and then you can focalize the light in a very small place, okay? And the way you do it is, uh, uh, we have a tuning fork that will do this, the, 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 uh, the AFM sensing. And on the lead leg of the tuning fork, we place this nano antenna that is a pyramid with a nano pyramid at the top. And this nano pyramid is very small. Okay, this is a COVID, uh, which is like a hundred nanometers. And this is actually a plasmonic uh, system that enters in resonance with your laser. So this makes the light, when you illuminate the, li the light on a large area, you actually couple the light with this nano antenna and you have a very strong illumination at this position. Okay, and what you can do with this, the most obvious is, okay, this is a picture made by uh, Raman spectral imaging, okay? And you cannot see it because you are using a microscope. You, can, you are using a micro Raman. And this is the image that you get when you have the nano antenna and you are using not a microscope, but you're using the nanoscope, okay? And the difference between these, the top image and the bottom image is the frequency you are looking at, is the Raman peak, Raman peak that you are looking at. So this is what spectroscopy is about. It's not about only about resolution, but it's about colors. And, the, and then you can really see different aspects of, of the picture. Like, for example, here on the... On the C, you have, this is actually graphene, okay? So the, you have different layers of graphene and this is why it's brighter here and less bright here, okay? But the most important aspect for our discussion here is not only, is not about the resolution, but it's the following. We have been talking that uh, quantum effects is very strongly related to, to uh, interference effects, right? So imagine that you have uh, atom, atom motion here and atom motion there. And the two fields, they go to the same position and are they going to interfere or not? Is interfering happening here? And the answer is, if the distance between these two locations, let's say that they are they are uh, the atomic movement is in phase. Okay, there should be correlation, and there should be interference here. However, if this distance is too small, you cannot sense this in the far field. If the emitter, if uh, uh, the if the correlation size of the emitter is smaller than the wavelength of light you cannot detect it in the far field. You have to come with an antenna, which is the same procedure that we use to increase resolution. And then you can sense now the uh, coherence that happens between emitters that are distanced by a few nanometers, okay? And if you do that, uh, we can 
demonstrate it happens, okay? Just by approaching, this is, a, we are doing Raman spectroscopy on a single graphene layer. And the graphene layer, it, it can vibrate like this, that's the breathing of the hexagon, or it can vibrate like that. It's another vibrational mode. This is the stretching of the uh, of the carbon-carbon uh, bond. And this, this phonon gener generates a peak here, and this phonon generates a peak there, okay? So what happens is when you approach the tip from the emitter, you have the signal that's weak and the signal gets strong, okay? You're just approaching the nano antenna from the emitter and the signal is enhancing. But the enhancement will be different for each of these phonons. And why will it be different? Because this is a phonon that does not break the hexagonal symmetry of the, of the material. And this is a phonon that does break the symmetry of the phonon, of the material. So this one does not change the light polarization, but this one does. This means that when the light coming from different positions, go to the antenna and the light comes from this phonon, it will interfere at the antenna constructively. But for the other phonon, when, it, when they reach, the, the interference will be destructive because it changed the polarization of light. And actually when you see now, the ratio between the increase of these two peaks as you approach the tip, you see that these two D peak, that is this one here, it increases faster than the other, okay? And with this, we can measure the, corre the correlation length that is uh, existing for the phonons inside the material. And in this situation, we measure it as 44 nanometers, okay? So if you want to see correlation of light emission in a molecule, you need to, it, this is a small system, you need to go with uh, your detector, or in this case, the antenna, very close to the material, otherwise you cannot measure it. And if you go deeper, we see one thing that is interesting. You can take the graphene and build a device, okay? So I take the graphene here, I put a gate that I can apply a voltage and then I put contacts and I come with my antenna on top. And what I will do now is I will change what we call, you change the, the doping of the system. What you are doing is you are injecting electrons or you are removing electrons in this material. Okay. Okay, in the in the graphene that is here, and what we see is that this difference in behavior, if you dope the material uh, in one direction or the other, which means if you inject electrons or if you remove electrons, the difference between the enhancement of these two peaks goes to one, which means there is no difference when the material is neutral. So this this is meaning that this interference effect or the correlation length that happens in, this, the, in the material depends on the electronic structure of the material. It depends on the electrons being there or not being there, okay? So these are all uh, different aspects of how to measure these uh, quantum coherence, quantum phenomena in a very small level, in a very controlled way. So this is what I wanted to bring to you. And here I acknowledge some people relate to this work. Okay, so these are the people in uh, in Belo Horizonte, people from Minas Gerais, and we are starting a very prof uh, good collaboration now that I hope will we'll bring many uh, interesting uh, new aspects. And with this, I thank you for your attention.